Hello, I'm Dr. Torna Pittman from a Gender Equality Tasmanian Statewide Family Violence Service. Welcome to video eight on children and coercive control. Out of all the areas of coercive control, I do find the um, the effect on the children and what happens to children's lives really upsetting, as they um, they don't they don't always understand what's going on and it can take so long for them to recover from the effects of being coercively controlled and from a coercively controlling parent. A coercive controller in the family will affect everyone in the house, not just their partner. So whether there's um, older parents living in the house or pets and certainly the children, everyone will be affected by just the ambience in the house and the the types of control that the cause of controller uses and the uh, eruptions to the hum harmony in the household and the level of fear the whole family will be affected by it and many of us in this um video may well recognize aspects of coercive control in our own family of origin. It is at the core of many family disruptions and separations. When you trace them back, a coercive controller is often at the core of them because they are really able to, to turn people against one another, to create wedges between people, to divide and conquer, to use favoritism and scapegoating, and any pattern of emotional abuse um, and, and the dynamics of, of, of the course of conduct and the patterns of relating that I've been describing in all the previous videos, they, they get between people and they're not necessarily able to come together again afterwards. So today the presentation will mainly refer to coercive controllers as the father, partially because um, the statistics show that it is the mother and the children who are more at risk of coercive control than it is for the fathers. So stay tuned and I will be back shortly to dive straight in. again. So I have a PowerPoint to take you through today. Um, this PowerPoint is a course on the children and coercive control. But before I get into that, I'm just going to show you where we're up to in the series. As you know, this is a series of 10 and this is video 8 on the children and course of control. And next week is the second last, the post-separation consequences and challenges because of course of control. And then the last one, which is transformation, healing and recovery from course of control, really how to reconfigure our lives after having had our boundaries and rights annihilated by a coercive controller. Before I begin too, it's important to know that many of us do have family of origin relationships that are impacted by the course of control of one parent and it's statistically the father. Doesn't mean to say that a mother has not impacted upon her children as well, particularly if she turned to substances in order to be able to actually deal with the uh, abuse of the course of controller. A coercive controller will affect the dynamics, health and well-being of the entire family. So today's presentation, and I'm just going to take myself out of the screen so you've got more room to see, will be on um, the parenting style and the effects of a coercive controller. And I'll be using information from the Battered Women's Justice Project in Minneapolis in USA, Lundy Bancroft again, Dr. Emma Katz and Scott Miller who is a batterer, uh, another word for coercive control, batterer intervention specialist for the in the Duluth model. 
I've got a couple of video clips too that will help explain things further. So let's start with uh, something that is very worrying for most of, the, of us who work in the field and who understand coercive control well. We see this very disturbing double bind and societal contradiction a lot in our work and it is talked about a lot in the research, particularly um, Bancroft, Silverman and Ritchie have raised this in their book, which is about the batterer as parent. Prior to separation, pro professionals and other community members may be harshly critical of a mother whom they perceive as guilty of failing to protect her children from exposure to a batterer. Yet, after separation, the same people get suspicious of her motives for attempting to protect her children and may attribute children's symptoms to the mother's alleged anxiety over protectiveness or vindictiveness against the alleged abuser. Now that places many mothers in a double bind. It's very evident in our work how worried they are post-separation about what will happen with the children when they have a coercive controller who is in there for a post-separation fight. If coercive control is a colonizing, self-centered, selfish attitudinal and behavioral style, it follows that the parenting style of the coercive controller will be as well. It'll be all of those things, colonizing of the children, self-centered and selfish. The parenting style will also be superior, entitled and adversarial, demanding catering and submitting from the children rather than meeting their actual developmental, emotional and physical needs. There will be a pattern of disregard, obstruction or overpowering of the children's rights and boundaries, the same as for the mother. The children are also affected by whatever the mother is subjected to. So again, depending on the style of the coercive controller, if he's incredibly controlling in the area of, say, the social arrangements, then the children are going to be heavily affected by that control as well. And if the coercive controller is heavily controlling in um, controlling the everyday routines and what can be eaten and what time everything needs to be done and how clean things need to be and all the, the ways that the household runs, then the children are affected by that as well. So whichever style the coercive controller uses, the children will also be impacted by that and will have effects from that. So the Battered Women's Justice Project uh, talks about the way that parental communication and interaction should be on the left-hand side here. And it should be for children measured, constructive, child-focused, concrete, trustworthy and safe. On the right hand side, in coercive control, parental communication and interaction is volatile, unproductive, focused on the coercive controller and his needs, indefinite, unreliable and dangerous. So there's a big difference there between the type of parenting that would be um, expected of a more equal or egalitarian relationship as opposed to a coercively controlling relationship. On the left-hand side, parental decision-making should be practical, child-centered and responsible. But in coercive controlling parental decisions are making, the parental decision-making is more impractical, parent-centered and irresponsible which is what women worry about so much post-separation when they are not around to make sure that the children get most of their needs met. Down on the left-hand side, parental roles and boundaries in a more egalitarian relationship should be well-defined and child-centered, so based around the child's developmental needs, their emotional needs, their physical needs. But in coercive control, parental roles and boundaries are unclear and they're partnered centered. They're based around more about what the coercive controller needs, what they think, what they want, rather than it being um, child centered. 
So a child really needs, on the left-hand side, physical safety, emotional support, economic security, protection from abuse, being accountable, having parents that are accountable, having separate needs from the parents, having parental support, and, and their parents have got some kind of autonomy. But what happens in a course of controlling relationship is that there can be, rather than physical safety, there can be physical abuse. It can be minor or major. It can be excessive, coercive, unnecessary, threatening discipline, or it can go all the way up to sexually exploiting and coercing the child. Instead of emotional support in a coercively controlling relationship, there will be a lot of emotional abuse, rejecting the child, denigrating, shaming of the child and fluctuating interest. Instead of economic security, in a coercively controlling relationship, there'll be economic abuse, refusing to provide, interfering with mother's employment and denying resources or controlling resource, resources. So that the children have some fear of whether they'll be able to uh, acquire things, have the same things as other children, whether they can go, can go on school excursions, for example, whether they've got enough clothes or shoes. In some way, shape or form, their econ economic security is threatened. Instead of experiencing protection from abuse, they experience being tools of abuse, where the coercive controller uses the child to pit against or monitor and disrespect the other parent. Instead of being accountable parents who own where they go wrong and make mistakes and apologize and heal any, any wedge that might be inadvertently driven between the parent and the child, in a coercively controlling relationship, the coercive controller will deny any impact, will justify, refuse to apologise, will interfere in counselling for the child and will often lie about the sorts of behaviours that they were actually perpetrating in the family. And instead of separate needs where the child's needs are separate to the adults and really important, in a coercively controlling relationship, the coercive controller regards the child's needs as identical to his. They ignore the child's separate needs and their interests or perceptions and attributing anything different that the child wants to the coercive controller to the fault of the other parent. So if the child doesn't want to see the parent or doesn't want to do something or has a different opinion on things, then the coercive controller will inevitably blame the other parent, the mother. Instead of receiving parental support in a coercively controlling relationship, the child will receive parental sabotage where there'll be the disrupting of the child's relationship with the other parent, the disrupting of their schedule, their routine, um, a refusing of the coercive controlling parent to enforce the rules that have generally been in place, withholding information about the child and using a new parent to simply replace the other parent, which is inevitably the mother. And instead of parental autonomy, so that both parents are autonomous and have agency and voice, in a coercively controlling relationship, there'll be relentless harassment by the coercive controller, trying to create persistent instability, insecurity or unpredictability for the child and the other parent. Now, sometimes a coercive controller will just simply disappear and will not be really trying to control um, the children and the mother post-separation. Everything can happen where there can be, a, uh, the coercive controller can go for full custody or, or disappear and to show no interest at all. But either way, the most common presentation is, is of quite a considerable amount of harassment, even if it's periodic, for the arrangements to go the way of the coercive controller. Scott Miller. My name is Scott Miller. One of the things I do in this work around domestic violence is work with men who are typically court ordered into a program to hopefully become nonviolent with their families. 
and I've been doing that work for 14 years. And one of the things I've learned from them is how they get their way as men in the home. And one of those tactics uh, that are on the power and control wheel that men use is this use of children as a way to leverage her to either start doing things that she's not or stop doing things that she is. This use of children is, is as I've said, really linked to her desire uh, to, to be these children's mother, the love that she has for them. He sees this and, and he knows that if there's any way to get her to stop or start doing something, it's to use the most precious thing in her life, which are her kids. This can take a lot of different forms. So, for example, in a relationship where it is ended and they're apart, she will have certain ways of raising that particular child. So uh, if, it's a, if it's a young child, uh, the child will nap at a certain time and then get up and have a, have a snack and then have lunch at a certain time. And really, you know, anybody who's parented children know that, especially when they're young, kind of that structure and predictable way that the day uh, goes, uh, goes on is, is important to children. And so what he'll do is he'll interrupt that on purpose. So what we hear from women who pick up their kids through a visitation center, for example, is that the kids come back with loaded diapers or he will stuff the children full of sugar prior to sending the kids back, knowing full well that because he hasn't napped them and now he's filled them full of sugar, that they will be a nightmare for the rest of the day with her when, when she takes them home. And it really goes to this realization that I'll, although these men love their kids, their desire to control and make their partner pay for something they have done supersedes that love because they will use those kids as tools to get back at her. In another instance, you might have a father who says to the mother of these children, if you leave me, if you don't do what I say, I will take your children and you'll never see them again. Now, for most of us who work in the courts, we know that that's a pretty difficult thing to achieve is to force another parent into a position where they never get to see their children. But because he always gets his way in that home, she's come to understand that this is a real possibility that he can actually achieve this. And so it drives home this, this idea that, that I better do what he says because nothing's more important than my kids. And if he takes them from me, um, then I lose a big part of myself. And he knows that and he uses it against her. Very disturbing words by Scott Miller, um, who has had so much experience around working with men who are coercively controlling of the women and the children. So common parenting challenges for coercive controllers are that they will use physical or sexual abuse, they will use emotional abuse, they will use economic abuse, they will use the child as a tool, they will deny the impact of the abuse and they will ignore the child's needs and they'll undermine the other parent and they will use relentless harassment. Now, if we take each one of those as a continuum, depending on the style of the coercive controller, there may be little or no physical, let alone sexual abuse. There may be very high emotional abuse. There may be medium economic abuse, but it depends on the style of the economic, on the coercive controller. And, but irrespective of the style, all of those features are quite possible where there's coercive control uh, in the family. So common ways children experience the abuse. Exposure during pregnancy, when they were in utero, they may, may well experience the abuse of their mother. The child may directly intervene in, uh, when they see or hear abuse in the household. The child may experience direct harm from the coercive controller. The child may be coerced to join in the abuse. The child is an eyewitness to abuse. The child may hear it or overhear things about it. 
The child may hide, retreat, tune out, turn to substance abuse or actually run away. The child reactions to abuse are generally fear, anxiety, trauma, doom, confusion, distrust and insecurity, anger, guilt, shame, complicity, vengeance, moodiness, rage, abandonment, betrayal, fatigue, protectiveness and hopelessness. Now it will be different for every child and it will depend upon their developmental stage but as a rule they are children's reactions to abuse and the impact of abuse on the child will create developmental problems, behavioural problems, emotional problems, cognitive problems, relationship problems and health problems. There will be damage to the child's economic stability or security from poverty, homelessness and social isolation for example. And Again, every child will have a different array of problems and there are those children who do not appear to be affected in any of those ways so much at all. But what the research has been trying to say is that more likely than not, there will be impact of abuse on the child that will come out in one of those ways. It will depend upon the style of the coercive controller and more importantly, it will depend upon whether they've got another really good role model like their mother or different members of the family to which they can turn to for nurturing and um, sustenance and security and safety. So where the impact on the child and the impact on the victim's parenting, on the mother's parenting are intertwined because the mother's parenting has to incorporate the impact on the child of the coercive controller. And that can be really what, what I call super parenting. It's not normal parenting to have to do that. It's the type, it's, parenting is hard enough as it is when you have an equal egalitarian relationship. But when you're living with a coercive controller, to parent uh, in, in the face of coercive control is one of the most difficult things that mothers are put through. Research on children's exposure to domestic violence has tended to focus primarily on two aspects of their experience, the trauma of witnessing physical assaults against their mother and the tension produced by living with a high level of conflict between their parents. However, these are just two elements of a much deeper problem pervading these children's daily life which is that they are living with a batterer. The parenting of men who batter exposes children to multiple potential sources of emotional and physical injury, most of which have not been recognised widely. That's by Bancroft. Coming up is a video that a video clip of a family where the father is well known in the community. He he coaches cricket. He's well loved in the community, he gets on well with everybody, but privately it is a different story for this family. Take a listen. Beautiful afternoon, wasn't it? Sure was, mate. Have a good one, Ray. Say hi to Jenny for me. Something good's cooking in there. My friends love my mum. She makes them triple cheese toasties and she set up a superhero party for my birthday. It was awesome! You know you said we need some time away together. Yeah. How about Easter long weekend? We're at Dad's for Easter. Yeah, but for something different. Ben, do your homework before you switch that on. I was only a couple of minutes till dinner. What did I say? Turn it off! I don't care whether it's five minutes or fifty. No games until homework is done. That's fine. Ben, put it away. We're eating soon. What? Is this glass? I broke a glass earlier before I left. I, I thought I cleaned it all up. Cleaned it up? Are you stupid or something? Did a bloody good job of that, didn't you? What if I was barefoot? 
I'll just slice my foot right open. I'm so sorry. Well, you've got time for holidays, but no time to clean the bloody file! Dad says boys don't cry. What's happening, Paul? Nothing. Everything okay over there? She left a piece of bloody glass on the floor. Lucky I had my shoes on. Then bit. Mate, pull your head in. What's going on? He's a loon. So there's an example of authoritarian parenting or as Lundy Bancroft calls it, power parenting. So research and clinical evidence indicates that a batterer's behaviour towards the children's mother is in fact a really important indicator or predictor of how he's likely to treat the children. So Lundy Bancroft says that there will be an authoritarian, entitled, rigid, controlling, dictatorial, non-conflict resolving and unempathic parenting style. And there was evidence of that in the video. There'll be under-involvement, neglect and irresponsibility towards the children. There will be undermining of their mother, overruling or ridiculing her, using a contemptuous attitude towards her in front of the children, which we saw in the video. There'll be self-centeredness. The batterer expects catering from children to, to meet his needs, not vice versa. They're very poor emotional boundaries. Manipulativeness, using the children as pawns to control or abuse the mother, confusing them regarding their mother and making them feel she or they are to blame for any of the abuse in the household. The ability to perform under observation is strong in a coercive controller or as Lundy Bancroft calls them, a batterer. They know how to do that, do that in public, but there's a deep contrast between public and private behaviour takes in an interest in the children only when it's self-serving. So if the child does really well at something, the coercive controller will step up and take the credit for it rather than actually acknowledging where the credit comes from and expecting them to behave like mature adults, not children, and affecting negatively affecting their values and their belief systems. And lastly, trauma bonding. It's a cycle. It's where the coercive controller brings the soothing relief after being the one to perpetrate the abuse. And this can happen after, you know, an incident of yelling, screaming, throwing things, or just putting the child down and making them feel really terrible and shaming them. And then after that, they may be the coercive controller may be the one that does the soothing and are being kind for a while and and trying to you know pretend it never happened and the child feels thankful for the kindness eager to forgive and feels cared for and so the child equates the coercive controller with not only the person who does the abuse but the person who helps them with the abuse and when you get a lot of cycles of this the child can be trained to just be grateful when the abuse stops and even if they don't get any kindness or attention or um, care afterwards. So that is a really big problem with living with a, a coercive controller is the trauma bonding. So the, fa the mother and the children can all be trauma bonded to the coercive controller. Now, Lundy Bancroft talks about post-separation parenting, the things that he's concerned about. He says, whilst they're all living together, 
the danger of a coercive controller it can be mediated to some extent by the mother's ability to protect them. There are serious physical, sexual and psychological risks posed by coercive controllers towards the children. Their post-separation conduct can interfere with children's emotional healing from the traumatic experiences already undergone. The exposure to post-separation threats or assaults on the mother can impede the children's emotional healing and the risk of undermining mother-child relationships and maternal authority yet is, is very, very high and yet the recovery of children is dependent on their relationship with the non-battering parent, which is generally the mother. Mothers can't monitor the batterer's parenting or retaliatory tendencies when um, it is post-separation. Rigid authoritarian parenting, severely controlling, harsh disciplinary style, which will intimidate the children and awaken, again, those trauma traumatic memories so they don't get a chance to heal. Neglectful or irresponsible parenting as the batterer has difficulty on as focusing on children's needs due to the selfish and self-centered tendencies of the coercive controller. They don't see the children as having separate needs to them and that they have rights and boundaries and they have the need to be looked after and attended to. The coercive controller sees it more the other way around. It's worse when batterers care for children for longer periods than they are used to because while as they were living in the family, the, generally the mother did all the caring, but post-separation, that's not possible. So as well, the coercive controller can be intentionally neglectful, um, use a very neglectful parenting style as a way to win their children's loyalty. They can intermittently show interest in their child and then ignore them for extended periods, which really is emotionally injurious to the child. They don't know how to make sense of that. And it's very difficult for a mother to explain it. Verbally and emotionally abusive parenting styles, using the children as weapons against the mother, using post-separation as a way to control the mother. So the verbal and emotional abuse that's present pre-separation continues post-separation and there can be the weaponization of children. Alternating between harshness and leniency, a sense of chaos and lack of predictability in the children's environment. Using visitation as a time to encourage disrespect of their mother and to feel ashamed of being close to her and to defy her authority. Children may believe they must protect their mother, father or their siblings. The batterers demand emotional catering from their children. So the children can become mini adults trying to look after everybody else rather than getting looked after themselves. Relationships with siblings often have high tension because of favoritism and scapegoating. Even worse than just the usual sibling problems, this is because of the actual divide and conquering tendencies of a coercive controller. Most batterers are unable to create or support most of the critical healing elements that a child needs. They just can't do it. Mistreating the children out of anger towards the mother teaching them negative beliefs about her, threatening to kidnap or to take custody of the children, driving recklessly, quitting his job to avoid paying child support, letting the children do things that he knows the mother wouldn't permit. Coming up is Emma Katz, Dr. Emma Katz, who has uh, really done a lot of research on with children about the effect of coercive controlling parents on them. In the case of uh, Dr. Katz's work, it's the fathers. Take a listen to her podcast. Sole perpetrating father or stepfather and what had happened when their mother had split up with the father and tried to get away but the father had carried on stalking and harassing the mum and to the mum the children also. These were children for whom stalking from their father or their stepfather was part of their everyday life. It, indeed, it often dominated their everyday life. And they were trying to keep safe from it, but it was very difficult. 
mm. and that they were getting very, very little help actually from the authorities here in the UK or in Finland. And we looked at how these children experienced these men's fathering behaviours because many of them were, they, they either were still in, in touch with the fathers in some way or through the stalking they, they were experiencing this very violent, problematic fathering. So we, we asked the children about how they were experiencing the fathering of these men who were stalking them and their mothers. There were three themes that came out and one was that sometimes they found the fathers to be incredibly dangerous so that was their overriding feeling. They were aware that their fathers could turn up anywhere at any time to harass them or attack them. Their fathers frequently did this, they were scared. One boy described how my dad brought some other men around to the house and they were banging on the doors and I was frightened for my life and I hid. And another child described how dad used to lurk in their back garden. And one time when he was out there, he chopped down my tree, which the child interpreted as a sort of act of spite from the father to the child. The children were sometimes scared to leave their pets when they went to school because they didn't know if the pet would still be alive when they came back. You know, leaving sort of hamsters or guinea pigs or dogs in the house unprotected. They'd gone to school and the mum had gone to work. So a lot of it was living in great fear of the father. Some children described a kind of fathering from these men that was about the men putting on this show of being a really great father to the wider community and sometimes to the children themselves. You know, coercive control perpetrators are very manipulative. So you, you can pretty much guarantee that their behaviour will be very manipulative. And one way that that was occurring for the children is that dad would, would show up at the school and talk about what a great dad he was and make a big show of everyone seeing him greeting his children and, and loving them and, and being attentive towards them so that all the onlookers would think, oh, what a great dad. And it was very purposeful, like a show that he was putting on. Similarly, some of the children found that the way that dad was talking to them, he was trying to sort of set them on this guilt trip where he was making them feel responsible for his feelings. Two daughters described how they would go and see dad at the weekend and he would say, your mum makes me cry, your mum is making me so upset, I'm having to take antidepressants because of what your mum is doing to me. And then he would say things like, I'm so sad that you're not seeing me more often you're the only ones who really love me. And so he was presenting himself as a sort of helpless victim, although he was actually wielding enormous power over them through these statements because he was emotionally manipulating them into feeling that they had to stay in contact with him for the sake of his well-being. They would come back home after these visits, which were court ordered here in the UK, and they were distraught. And, you know, they were out maybe eight or nine or ten at the time, these two girls, and one of them would be off school every Monday because she felt so awful and she'd just be distraught and she'd be on the sofa crying her eyes out and the mum was hugging her and trying to comfort her. But there was nothing much that the child or the mum could really do about it because it was court ordered. Very intense words from Dr Katz. It's a very, a, clearly a very intense research project as well, talking to the children. There are some more things that she has specified from that research and that coercive control pervades the children's lives too because children are placed in isolated, disempowering and constrained worlds which hampers their resiliency, their healthy development and contributes to emotional and behavioural problems. Perpetrators trap mothers and children in unrealities, meaning that they are shaped by manipulations, distortions, excuses, minimizations, and denials to keep them all confused. The micro-regulation of everyday life also affects the children. Children also suffer from limited opportunities to choose, to feel free, and to develop a sense of independence and competence. And the control of time and movement within the home is really common. Perpetrators control and limit the amount of maternal attention that children could enjoy and reduced opportunities for fun and affection in their home. Children are conflicted about this and it contributes to withdrawn or aggressive behaviours. It's really common for a coercive controller to ruin special events, birthdays, family get-togethers with uh, with their behaviour. They don't seem to like to have people enjoying themselves. 
Isolation from the outside world. Perpetrators prevented children from engaging with wider family, peers and extracurricular activities. If the mother wasn't allowed out, neither were the children. Children miss out on knowing about healthy relationships because of lack of mixing and socialising and freedom and also unable to create resilience building non-abusive relationships. Deprivation of resources and imprisonment. Children told what they can do for example, what they can eat, how they should dress, when they are to remain inside, they can be locked in the house, the power can be turned off, the modem can be taken away. Coercive control can become very depraved in the extent of control that uh, will be that a mother and children will be subjected to. It can get to the point where really they're not allowed to do anything without asking the coercive controller. And what they're prevented from doing means that they, don't, they do not have a life at all. Coercive control is child abuse. Both adults and children suffer and are the targets of controlling behaviors. They find ways to resist, and they do, but children need help to recover from it and justice for the crimes that have been committed against them. The mother has to parent in the face of the coercive controller's parenting style and with the losses and deprivations she finds herself sustained and continues to, to, to sustain. And separation doesn't solve the problem at all. So post-separation, women have to restore their physical health, their well-being and their safety and their autonomy. They have to restore their sexual respect, safety and autonomy. They have to restore their economic independence and security. They have to restore their relationship with themselves, with others, their social network and their children. And they have to restore their voice and agency. Often, while the coercive controller is working actively to prevent her independence and ability to flourish and using child contact as a tool to continue a regime of coercive control. So in summary, a coercive controller does not parent in the same way as non-coercively controlling parents. A coercive controller will control the entire household, not just their partner. And this includes the children, pets and other family members in the house. And it is critical that children's needs and rights are taken into account along with the needs and rights of the victim parent to recover from pre-separation abuse and to restore their lives from second-class citizenship. And that can be very um, difficult to do post-separation when the coercive controller continues a regime of coercive control. It's just the post-separation version. And that is the topic for next week. So thank you so much for listening today and for um, hanging in there. It's quite a difficult amount of information and it's complex and it's very, very sad and disturbing. Um, luckily, there are a lot more researchers now looking into this and there will be in, most likely in the future great efforts made to prevent this from happening post-separation for mothers and children. The fathers will have less rights if they're a coercive controller to actually continue that control post-separation. But until then, we're going to have to provide as much support to women and children as possible. And indeed to any gender who is experiencing coercive control. So again, thank you for um, being with me today while I'm explaining all of this. I look forward to seeing you all next week talking about the post-separation challenges and consequences of coercive control. I hope you have a good week, stay safe, stay well, and I'll see you all next week. Bye-bye for now.